Well, we slowly start with the introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Loren Schlappach, and it's my absolute pleasure, together with uh, co-chair Scott Watson, on behalf of the entire Pediatric Sepsis Definitions Task Force, uh, sponsored by SCCM, to present the novel Phoenix Criteria for Sepsis in Children. This is a truly exciting moment for us after many years of work, and we feel immensely humbled and fortunate to have been part of such a magnificent group of researchers and colleagues. Um, these are disclosures, um, and we would like to acknowledge the, um, the vision and leadership from SCCM to have founded this work st strongly as well, you know, mentored in the beginning through Jerry Zimmerman, who can't be here today, and Tex Kisun. So, when we think about the burden of pediatric sepsis, as shown in the Lancet Global Burden of Disease paper, roughly half of worldwide sepsis cases affect actually, actually pediatric age groups. And this leads to about three million deaths every year. As you can see here, the majority of those affect children that are less than five years of age. So these children have not only different epidemiology, but they have as well different comorbidities, different immune systems, different developmental characteristics, and even different outcomes to adults with sepsis. And this makes it so um, necessary that we actually derive and validate the um, pediatric sepsis criteria based on pediatric cohorts. And as we all know, you know, sepsis essentially at the beginning of life, in the first few years of life, has an impact which goes way beyond mortality. Children with sepsis, even if they survive, they may suffer from um, sometimes lifelong sequelae uh, across a, a range of core outcome sets. And so this leads to a um, to magnified whole of, whole of society impact for many decades to come. And as we all know, when we mean sepsis at present, one of the challenges has been that pediatricians mean very, very different things. The, um, the intensivist actually sees more you know, children at the right end of the spectrum where multi-organ dysfunction actually is, is, is visible. The big challenge is that in pediatrics where a lot of viral infections uh, predominate, there's a funnel that's extremely challenging in particular for ED and general practice setting which are confronted to many, many children with fever and flu. And so in, in this zone between balancing sensitivity and specificity, there is actually a sweet spot where we have criteria for a disease that are specific, that are useful, but as well, you know, sensitive enough to capture children um, who are at high risk of a poor outcome. And of course, such criteria are, are important as well for the future, because these criteria and the timing of those relates as well to the likelihood that the patient may benefit or be responsive to, to certain interventions. The problem in this field has been that for pretty much 20 years, there's been criteria for pediatric sepsis which were not based on data, which were eminence-based and crafted actually to allow enrollment in the RESOLVE trial back on then. And um, not only have they not been validated, but the limitations of using SIRS as a criterion for sepsis has been highlighted in adults and in children in a number of studies. And it's becoming increasingly clear that SIRS criteria are actually probably more adaptive rather than maladaptive processes. But the way the, the 2005 criteria have been used across the world was so variable that it has actually impacted consistent and comparable um, use, for example, impacting on how we measure sepsis um, around the world. And from this perspective, actually, the crafting of sepsis 3 in 2016, the re released in JAMA, was a major step forward using data-driven approaches, actually, um, coupled with systematic reviews and consensus criteria. However, as the authors stated explicitly, these criteria were neither designed nor derived nor actually properly validated for children, leaving a real gap. In addition as well, SEPSI-3 was based on, on units in the United States and in Germany, and so there were, was no contribution of lesser resourced settings actually to the, the data. And the score used, the SOFA score, has, has been pre-existing. And to this date, actually, we do not know if this was sort of the best type of score um, adaptation for, for that topic. And finally, as well, the shock criteria used criteria that, which were partially different, actually, from the criteria used, actually, within the SEPSI score. And so with, with these considerations in, in mind, we've embarked on the process to derive and validate novel criteria for sepsis in children. And my co-chair, Scott Watson, is going to give you a brief overview of the work done in the past years. Thank you. <laughs> 
So a little over five years ago, this uh, panel was formed with uh, SECM support. Jerry Zimmerman was instrumental in, uh, in uh, enlisting SECM in this effort, and uh, they were uh, extremely helpful and, and, and made this happen, frankly. This seems like a long time, over um, five years, although in 2019 when we had our kickoff meeting, it became apparent that there were no data sets that were actually adequate or uh, remotely comparable to the data used in sepsis-3 to develop new criteria in children. Uh, and then, of course, in 2020, uh, the world changed a bit. Uh, but despite that, we forged ahead with a systematic review, an international survey, which we'll talk more about. Uh, Drs. Bennett and Sanchez-Pento successfully com uh, competed for funding to assemble a massive uh, uh, database uh, made up of EHR records from uh, sites in the U.S. and across the world uh, and began to get uh, data access. Uh, we published some additional manuscripts in 2022 and then over the past year analyses have been conducted in earnest uh, and then over the summer uh, we launched the Delphi process and uh, came to consensus uh, late summer, early fall. So this is uh, just a picture of uh, before we kind of knew what we were in for back in 2019 uh, in Salzburg. Uh, here are the members of the task force with their uh, um, uh, country of residence and their expertise. One thing to note here is that uh, the Society of Critical Care Medicine, of course, is a critical care society, but uh, they were visionary enough to know that that is not adequate um, for uh, a condition such as sepsis, which involves so many other subspecialties. So this. Uh, task force was intentionally diverse in terms of um, uh, medical expertise uh, and in terms of geography. So we had members from 12 countries across uh, six continents. We had several guiding questions. Uh, we started off with what can we learn from sepsis 3, both the process uh, and uh, the subsequent debate after those results were released. Uh, we wanted to get a sense of what the needs of clinicians caring for children around the world were around uh, sepsis definitions and criteria. Uh, we want to maximize generalizability for diverse healthcare settings, both within the hospital and in uh, different, uh, differently resourced uh, environments. And then we wanted to capture sepsis as a disease or syndrome in a way that would enable screening for um, patients at risk of developing sepsis. And then finally, uh, we were trying hard to thread the needle uh, in terms of being pragmatic and characterizing this complex heterogeneous condition uh, without being overly simplistic. With that, we conducted a systematic review to um, obtain current evidence for the criteria, conducted a global survey, uh, and uh, the, uh, Drs. Bennett and Sanchez-Pinto uh, established their computational team for data analytics, and this all um, fed into really all of the work of the task force that ultimately led uh, to the Delphi process to finalize the criteria, which were then externally validated within the data assembled by the data team. We had um, uh, five uh, publications uh, up to today, starting back in 2020. Uh, as of today, we have uh, two more with uh, development and validation of the criteria, uh, really deep dive into the innovative methods uh, used uh, to develop them, and then the criteria themselves, uh, which are um, published in JAMA today, and there will be some QR codes later uh, to make it easy for folks to um, access those. So we're excited about this session. Uh, we're gonna, we have a host of great speakers to go through uh, the different topics. Uh, Halden Scott is gonna be talking about the systematic review, Mark Hall, uh, results of the survey, uh, Nelson Sanchez-Pinto and Tal Bennett about development of the criteria. Uh, Mark Peters and Matt Weens will discuss um, some of the controversies, some of the many controversies that uh, we encountered as we tried to develop these criteria with a diverse group. Uh, and then um, Eniton will be, Eniton Carroll will be talking about operationalizing the definition, uh, really how to uh, use the definitions uh, in your local environment. We're going to uh, conclude uh, first with a roundtable of, um, of the speakers. Uh, we'll ask some questions of them and then open up the, um, open up the microphones uh, on the floor for questions uh, from the audience. So we're excited uh, about this session and we're going to move on to Halden Scott who's going to present Criteria for Pediatric Sepsis, a historic perspective provided by Systematic Review. Thank you. No financial disclosures. 
I want to begin by acknowledging that this work was led by Kusa Menon and Lauren Source, who were the first and senior authors on the paper that was published in Critical Care Medicine in 2022, describing the results of the review. So why did we conduct a systematic review? Scott laid out some of the reasons, um, but variables identifying children with sepsis and their outcomes had not yet been described in this way. This was preparation for the definition's development following the approach of the adult sepsis 3.0 approach, and we wanted to summarize not only what was known about identifying sepsis in children, but also what seemed to work, and look at what predictors were readily available and used around the world. There were two aims of this work. The first was to identify variables associated with sepsis, severe sepsis, or septic shock in children with infection. And secondly, to find variables associated with multiple organ dysfunction or death in children with sepsis, severe sepsis, or septic shock. We would look at the following domains, demographic, clinical, laboratory, organ dysfunction, and illness severity variables. We followed standard methods for systematic reviews. We looked for studies with sepsis, septic shock, or septicemia in the title or abstract that were published between 2004 and 2020. There had to be an outcome of sepsis, septic shock, septicemia, newer progressive multi-organ dysfunction, or mortality. It had to be a case control cohort or randomized trial, including children from greater than 27 weeks to less than 18 years. Exclusion criteria included papers that did not have values within the first 24 hours after admission, no comparator group, or sepsis criteria not specified. We used uh, standard databases and the tool inside scope. Screening of the title and articles and data abstraction was all done by two independent reviewers and co-authors. Any discrepancies were resolved by a third reviewer. And for papers where we needed more data, the corresponding authors were contacted twice. A quality and prognostic studies tool was used to assess for quality and bias. And because we wanted to understand the settings where this work was done, we looked at uh, whether the countries were classified as lower income, lower middle income, upper middle income, or high income, following the World Bank classification system. To pool data for inclusion in the meta-analysis, it had to be reported in more than one study and reported in a similar way allowing for pooling of data. Applying these criteria yielded 106 published papers. Of these, 25 had data that couldn't be pooled or had a variable that just appeared in one study, so that left 81 for the full systematic review. I've highlighted here in yellow the column describing the number of studies in the analysis, and in orange, the number of patients. You will note that despite applying these uh, criteria to studies around the world, in the end, in the existing literature, there were only 18 studies representing the lower middle income or lower income countries, comprising 1.8% of patients in the data set. Uh, the ICU made up the majority of study settings, 84%, and 88% of patients. Thus, there were um, few studies that allowed us to evaluate that first aim, looking for variables among febrile children associated with the outcome of sepsis. Most of these were described in the narrative review and didn't make it into the pooled meta-analysis. Of those that did, two factors emerged as significant, decreased level of consciousness and PRISM score. As we switch to that second aim of what factors predict mortality among children with sepsis, I want to draw your attention to the mortality that we extracted from these studies. As you look on the left side of each of these figures are the high income countries. On the right side are the lower middle income countries. And the, on the left side of your screen is the um, data for sepsis, the right is septic shock, and the Y axis is the proportion of children in that study who experienced mortality. You will notice not only does mortality increase as we move to the lower income settings, the confidence bars widen as well, indicating less data available. So not only do we have fewer children or more children experiencing mortality, we have less data from these settings. 
In this data set, we identified factors associated with mortality. There were demographic variables, including malnutrition, chronic conditions, and oncologic conditions. Clinical variables, these shown are from the cardiovascular group, mechanical ventilation, and decreased level of consciousness, or GCS. Among the lab variables, acid-base variables were significant, renal and electrolyte variables, hematologic, albumin, procalcitonin, and ALT. Now we'll move to the organ dysfunction variables, which were also significant. On each of these um, forest plots, you'll see on the left side survivors, on the right side non-survivors, where our confidence interval isn't crossing one, we have significance. So both multi-organ dysfunction syndrome and number of organ dysfunctions was associated with mortality. Similar findings for the scores we looked at, including PIM3 here, and PRISM. Now, I think I'm not telling you a surprising finding that markers of organ dysfunction were associated with death in this data set. But this was an important step to take. Most of these scores were derived in general ICU settings. And here, we took a global sepsis population across settings and found that these markers of organ dysfunction, dysfunction were still relevant and predicted poor outcomes. So when we look at our two aims and what the systematic review produced, we found there were few criteria associated with sepsis among children with infection that we could identify in the existing literature applying these search strategies. This highlights two things. Um, one, it highlights that um, although there was preceding febrile illness risk stratification research, and as someone um, here from the emergency medicine setting, um, this has been the major project of our work to define outcome and um, predict risk in febrile illness. The outcomes and definitions of sepsis had rarely been used in that work, and thus wouldn't make it into this meta-analysis. Um, additionally, we found that criteria associated with mortality among children with sepsis were related to organ dysfunction, both concepts and scores, and some organ dysfunctions were more ominous than others. So this allowed us to identify variables commonly measured that were associated with mortality across settings and various sepsis definitions. It importantly identified differences in country income that contributed to mortality differences and differences in representation of patients in the published literature. Not only did this allow a comprehensive search for variables that would be important to include, but really highlighted the limitations of the existing literature in terms of representation of both lower income settings, non-ICU settings, that would be really important to address in the next phases of our work. I'd like to conclude by acknowledging uh, all the co-authors of this paper and the task force. Thank you so much, Holden. Um, what we didn't mention is we have ample room for discussions at the end, so we'll actually go through all of the talks before um, then having time for your questions and hopefully a lot of controversy you know, arising from this. The next speaker is um, Professor Mark Hall. That probably does not need much introduction. He's been clearly one of the stimulating um, minds in this work. And um, very thankful to have him as part of the task force with his immense knowledge as well on immunology in pediatric sepsis. Thank you, Mark. All right. Well, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good morning. Uh, so I have no relevant disclosures uh, as it relates to the content of this talk. But I will say that like obscenity, we think we know sepsis when we see it, but it turns out it's really hard to define. And the currently used sepsis definitions that we have, have heard about already this morning were largely developed by consensus, were not data-driven, were not developed uh, with a broad resource uh, 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 availability in mind. They can overlap with non-infectious diagnoses. They give the diagnosis of sepsis to patients who are not critically ill and are difficult to apply for all the purposes for which they're used. Uh, here are the consensus definitions from 2005 that we've heard about. And again, we, we think about sepsis as defined by these definitions, and it applies to many, many patients on the regular ward who do not have life-threatening disease. 
we're more used to thinking about in the ICU patients with severe sepsis septic shock, with organ dysfunction, and these definitions include a mixture of vital signs, laboratory abnormalities, and intervention-based criteria. And again, they were consensus-based and not data-driven. This is in contrast to the World Health Organization definitions, uh, which are less dependent on testing and more dependent on interactions that can happen in any resource environment. And we've heard about the sepsis three definitions as well, exclusively adult data, SOFA-driven, uh, the low and middle income countries were not specifically addressed, and the term sepsis does not differentiate local versus systemic effects. Uh, more on that soon. So, we want to understand what the people wanted. So we drafted, revised, and disseminated an uh, international survey that went out to 27 international societies who then uh, distributed it uh, to their members uh, in multiple different languages with items that asked about demographics, resource availability, current practice for sepsis diagnosis, viewpoints around the usefulness of the current sepsis definitions, what the new sepsis definitions should mean to those people, uh, and what, in fact, the word sepsis should mean. So as you can see, the survey went all over the planet uh, with the most heavy representation in North South America and Asia. There were 2,835 analyzable responses across the spectrum of high, upper middle, and low and low middle income countries. The work settings ranged from academic and metropolitan to non-academic and non-metropolitan, although the majority came from academic metropolitan hospitals. Uh, the majority of the practitioners worked in the PICU. However, uh, the ED and the regular hospital wards were represented robustly as well. Uh, the preponderance of the responses uh, were from physicians, though the survey was indeed multidisciplinary. So we asked the sites or individuals, what resources did they have available to them uh, for testing and interventions? So around testing, uh, 80% of respondents or more indicated that they had basic laboratory testing available to them. Uh, and similarly, 80% of respondents included that they were able to give fluid boluses, they were able to use vasoactives and provide some level of ventilatory support. When we asked the respondents, what do you use to recognize children with sepsis, using the word sepsis rather generically, uh, they indicated that vital signs, derangements in the host immune response, uh, and infection-related testing were key in their decision-making. But when we asked them how do they recognize septic shock, measures and markers of organ dysfunction, uh, most notably inotropic support, led the way. So we then asked them which of these patients would you say has sepsis? A child with local infection without organ dysfunction who's home, someone with pneumonia who's on room air, someone who might be hospitalized with local infection, uh, but without severe organ dysfunction, a child on the ward with an oxygen requirement, for example. Well, what about a patient who has life-threatening infection, but their only organ dysfunction is at the site of that infection? So let's say a patient with pneumonia who has an invasive mechanical ventilator, ventilatory requirement, but whose other organs are working fine. What about the patient who has life-threatening infection but with organ dysfunction that is remote from the site of infection. So again, a patient with pneumonia and a ventilator requirement who also has acute kidney injury. And then life-threatening infection with cardiovascular dysfunction where you throw, say, a vasoactive requirement in the mix. Well, clearly our respondents felt that local infection without organ dysfunction wasn't sepsis. But when it came to life-threatening infection, there was not unanimity around what we should call sepsis, but the answer is somewhere in there in the population of patients who has life-threatening organ dysfunction. Now, the use cases for sepsis definitions include recognition. Does this patient have sepsis? Or early recognition, is this patient developing sepsis? Correct disease classification, it, is this or was this sepsis or is it something else? What is the patient's risk for adverse outcomes or prognostication? Benchmarking, how good are we in taking care of this patient or population of patients compared to other practitioners? Who's getting sepsis? When are they getting it? What are they getting it with our, our, our epidemiology uses? And then, of course, understanding the biology of the disease, developing new therapies and testing them in studies. So we asked the respondents to evaluate how the consensus definitions, the sepsis three definitions, the WHO definition, worked in their hands. 
and they felt that recognition and early recognition was pretty good, but that the usefulness of these diseases, uh, of these uh, um, uh, criteria, fell off using other use cases. But the fourth line in each of those figures is what they want the new definitions to do. They want them to be great and broadly useful across all use, all use cases. So ask a, ask a question, you get the answer, right? So the limitation of this survey is the response rate was unknown, the denominator is unknown because we didn't know to whom uh, the surveys were sent by the individual societies. There was representation from low and middle income countries, but still relatively underrepresented compared to upper, middle, and high income countries. Uh, these are perceptions, not actual practice. These are, are clinicians' views, and they did not specifically address neonates. So the conclusion here is that the international community of clinicians who care for kids with life-threatening infection, they do have limits on their availability of diagnostic and therapeutic resources, but vital sign measurement and basic laboratory testing are frequently available. The community feels that current sepsis definitions, they're inadequate for use across the spectrum uh, of need, including recognition, quality benchmarking, and research. But they want a set of definitions that does it all. And it is not unanimous what the term sepsis should mean within our community, but there's strong belief that it should apply to life-threatening disease. So we turn to data for definitions which are pediatric specific and broadly applicable across resource settings. So again, thanks to the, to the group, particularly Luke, Lauren, Pierre, and Lauren for an outstanding uh, 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 bit of work around the survey. Thanks, Mark, that was excellent. Next, we're gonna hear from uh, Tal Bennett and Nelson Sanchez-Pinto about development of the criteria and the criteria themselves. All right, good morning. Thank you all for being here. So I'm gonna talk about development and validation of the criteria. Uh, my only disclosure is that we were funded by NICHD. Thank you to them uh, for their vision in, in supporting this, uh, for this work. So concurrent publication today, as, as others have mentioned, I wanna add, and uh, these slides are available through SCCM, that in the bottom right of this slide is a link to the GitHub repository where the code for much of this work will be made publicly available. So I'm gonna talk through the methods. Uh, Nelson will present the results, and then I'll uh, talk through some of the early discussion issues. So we began with a conceptual framework that the task force decided in 2019 that we would adopt, that sepsis in kids, in fact, was infection with life-threatening organ dysfunction. And I've always been a fan of this uh, posting from the JAMA Twitter feed after sepsis three, uh, which shows that same thing. So the way that we operationalize this is as follows. So suspected infection in the first 24 hours, we were really trying to target in first, we'll come back to hospital acquired later, first on kids who present with sepsis at the beginning of an encounter. Life-threatening, what that means is that the primary outcome for all of what we'll show you is in hospital mortality or encounter mortality. Organ dysfunction. And so I'm gonna show you how we identify the best performing organ dysfunction subcomponents of all of the pieces of scores that we evaluated. Importantly, those components needed to be applicable in both higher and lower resource settings. So this is a complex slide that shows the methods. I'm gonna break it apart. So step one, identify the best performing organ dysfunction subcomponents of existing scores. And what that means is that best was identified as the, the subcomponents that best predicted mortality in infected versus non-infected patients. And this table on the right side of the slide shows the complete space of subcomponents of existing scores that we evaluated in order to do that. And there's some, some familiar, uh, not names, but initials uh, on that list. And so a subcomponent, one example is, okay, what, are, what is the best cardiovascular subcomponent taking into account or considering all of the available cardiovascular subcomponents that we might put into a sepsis model. So step two was to take those best components and build a sepsis model. And so um, we, we 
identified the best. We then used a form of machine learning called stacked regression. You may have heard of model averaging or ensemble learning. This is in that family of methods. And so we stacked those best available subcomponents using a top level machine learning model. And that top level model also predicted mortality in, at this time in kids with suspected infection. Taking the best sepsis model, we then translated that best model into something that a human could use and not just a computer, so an integer-based score. The way we did that was using a grid search of the complete space of possible integer values of all the elements in those subcomponents, collapsing categories when there was no effect on overall performance. In step four, we selected binary thresholds from that integer score that would be used for the sepsis and septic shock criteria. And this was a modified Delphi process in partnership with the task force. Importantly, in the first three steps, we use as our primary metric of performance the area under the precision recall curve, or AUPRC. In clinical journals, you may be more familiar with the AUROC. And so the reason that we chose the AUPRC is as follows. So the y-axis is precision or positive predictive values. You may have heard it referred to. The x-axis is recall, recall or sensitivity, as you may be more familiar with. The dotted red line is the baseline event rate across the bottom. So the AUPRC reflects the difference between the model and the baseline event rate. When you have imbalanced classes of data, and a balanced class would be something like an event rate of 50%, imbalance would be closer to zero or 100%. Thank goodness, death in kids with sepsis is much closer to zero than 50%. There's imbalance there. AUROC can overestimate performance in that setting. Therefore, we use AUPRC. AUPRC also has a natural translation to implementation because it can be used to optimize positive predictive value and sensitivity when you're selecting thresholds. We'll show you how that works. So the no skill model, the model that doesn't add any value is down here at the baseline event rate. The AUPRC is up here. If it's 10 times higher, then it's, it offers 10 times as much predictive ability. At the last step, individual binary thresholds to identify the criteria are one point on that curve. And so we use positive predictive value and sensitivity as the metrics for that step four. And these are better closer to the top right corner. Keep that in mind as Nelson talks you through the results. All right. Thank you for coming, everyone. It's a little echoey. Hopefully you guys are hearing us. Um, well, um, so on to the results. So we were extremely proud and extremely excited to partner with uh, 10 study sites um, around the, the world, uh, six in higher resource settings and four in lower resource settings. Here's a map of the uh, distribution of our, of our collaborators. You can see uh, not only a wide distribution across the US, uh, but also with partners in Latin America, Africa, and Asia that were part of our um, uh, database development. This was mostly EHR data, and mostly uh, between 2000 and data uh, comprising 2010 through 2019, although some of the sites, for various reasons, when their uh, databases were developed, um, uh, provided uh, less uh, years. The, cohort, the final cohort size for our uh, development of our criteria was uh, over 3.6 million pediatric hospital encounters. Um, we divided this uh, data set, this 3.6 million encounters, into two main data sets. The, on the left uh, uh, here in the slide, the, a little bit over 3 million patients were used for the development of the criteria, uh, of which about 170,000 had uh, suspected infection in the first 24 hours. And then uh, about 600,000 patients were um, uh, retained for external validation. These were patients in three different sites, uh, two low resource settings and one high resource setting um, uh, for external validation of the criteria once the criteria were developed. So those were held out uh, until the end. And there were about 45,000 kids with suspected infection in the first 24 hours in that external validation set. Um, of note here at the bottom, we excluded uh, birth hospitalizations and post, uh, children who were, uh, had a postconceptional age of less than 37 weeks. Um, so this is not applicable to the premature babies and hopefully that's future work that, that, that will uh, continue and, and SCCM uh, will hopefully sponsor. Uh, 
just because we are pediatricians and we like to compare ourselves to adults. Um, this is the, uh, the size of the task force uh, data sets uh, that the adult uh, uh, use on the red bar. They use about 1.3 million encounters, most of them in the Pittsburgh, in the greater Pittsburgh area. And we use more than 3 million encounters from around the globe. So uh, this is, as of today, the largest database uh, for the development of data-driven consensus uh, definitions in medicine in general. So um, kudos to us in pediatrics. Importantly, and Halden uh, uh, mentioned this, this is, not, uh, this is not just an ICU exercise uh, of critical care physicians uh, trying to define you know, what's happening in our ICUs, but this is, across, this is a problem that, that occurs across the care continuum. So our data was highly representative of emergency medicine, the inpatient wards, as well as the ICU. We had a very representative population of patients with, uh, uh, this is the distribution ac across age groups. Uh, some of these age groups obviously uh, encompass, you know, for adolescent kids is maybe five or six years, where some of these age groups for the younger kids is only one month. Um, so we expect this difference in, in, in the size of the bars. But just as of note, the smaller group, which is the zero to one month old uh, neonates, and these are term neonates who are returning to the hospital with, uh, with, uh, to, to receive um, acute care. Uh, these are about 90,000 kids in that, in that smaller group. So we have enough representation across all, all um, age groups. We also had a very uh, representative um, uh, uh, population in terms of race and ethnicity. Uh, you may note that the NIH, uh, because this was an NIH-funded study, um, uh, asked, you know, we had to report the NIH categories, which may not be very applicable internationally. Um, so we had to sort of fit something into, into those categories. But uh, I think the, the most illust uh, illustrative piece here is that uh, uh, white non-Hispanic kids were less than 20% of the whole data set. So this is not a, a very skewed um, data set. It's widely representative. Uh, finally, the, the subset of patients in which we did the most of the work, which is the suspected infection patients, patients who had um, received antimicrobials and uh, uh, microbiotic testing within the first 24 hours of presenting to the hospital. These were about, in the development said they were about 172,000 kids who met that criteria. And you will notice that uh, patients that came from higher resource settings uh, were the majority of that subset. And that was just because of the size of the data sets that we had access to in, in higher and lower resource settings. However, um, Tell mentioned our primary outcome was mortality, and the way when we are uh, uh, developing these criteria, we were using the machine learning approaches, the way we are tuning those models, the way we are um, calibrating those models is based on, on the reference on the primary outcome. So the, the measure that really matters for sample size calculation and for uh, developing these models is actually the outcome, and because our outcome was mortality, that's what really we cared about. And as you can see here on the right, the, the absolute number of deaths in lower and, uh, and higher resource settings was very similar across, uh, across those two settings which has uh, allowed us to then more confidently be able to develop these criteria uh, across resource settings. So in the first step, as Tell was mentioning, was finding those best performing organ dysfunction subcomponents across all those uh, uh, organ dysfunction criteria that, that we were um, evaluating. We're not going to go through every one of those. Uh, uh, there's a very long uh, table in the supplement of the paper that I encourage you to read if you're interested. I'm just going to show one for, uh, for example, uh, for, as an example of how we were looking at this data and how we were interacting with the, with the rest of the task force when we were presenting this, this data to move some of these subcomponents forward in, in our data driven approach. And this is, the, in this case, the cardiovascular um, dysfunction. So you can see there on the second column of that table are all the different uh, organ dysfunction criteria that we evaluated. So IPSCC um, is the, uh, the 2005 uh, um, organ dysfunction criteria that were put forth by the International Pediatric Sepsis Consensus Conference um, uh, criteria, uh, sometimes you know, called the Goldstein criteria, although we, know, we don't like to call them that, but just for, for reference. Um, and uh, PILO2, Podium, Prolux, PSOFA, Shock Index, Vasoactive Inotrope Score, and then a Vasoactive Medication Count, which was a proxy for Vasoactive Inotrope Score that we also evaluated. Um, and what you can see here, when we looked at the area under the precision recall curve uh, across all these patients in, 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 in the duration set and uh, validated them, you can see that the PILA2 cardiovascular uh, subcomponent and then the count of vasoactive medications had the highest AUPRC, and they also had uh, uh, you know, comparable uh, area under the curve. So those were the two subcomponents that we advanced to the next stage of the machine learning um, uh, uh, modeling that we did. Uh, 
And so uh, we went through, again, all the organ systems. We selected the subcomponents that performed the best. Uh, some, in some instances, some of the uh, subcomponents had very similar performance, and these were brought to the, to the task force for, uh, through a Delphi process to select the co subcomponent that, that made most, more sense. For example, one that required less uh, uh, complex testing or, or a lab test that was more widely available. And then we ended up uh, including uh, subcomponents from PILOT2, from PSOFA, from the DIC score, from the from BIS, from um, the uh, podium um, scores. We then moved into the all these best performing subcomponents to the machine learning uh, uh, second step of our of our modeling, which is developing these sepsis models using stack regression. And the two best performing models in that in that approach were the uh, one based on the top model being a rich uh, 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 penalized regression and a lasso uh, uh, penalized regression model. And you can see the performance uh, uh, in AUPRC and uh, ROC here on the right for those two models. Now the, the difference between these two is that the lasso-based model is a penalized regression model that tries to minimize the number of variables that you need to make an ac accurate prediction. So you try to, it tries to build the most parsimonious models, the least number of variables possible that still gives you uh, adequate performance at, 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 at predicting mortality. So let me translate that to you know what we really care about in, in terms of, uh, of of sepsis. This is this is the model that's able to to find within the patients who have suspected infection the subset of patients who have life threatening infection with the least number of uh, of variables or life threatening organ dysfunction with the least number of variables. That's what the lasso was able to do. Whereas the rich model uh, included all the variables that we put forward to the machine learning uh, side, and it included variables for eight organ systems, and the lasso uh, for only uh, four organ systems, cardiovascular, respiratory, coagulation, and neurologic. The, or importantly, these two models had a very similar performance, both in AUPRC and a area under the receiver and operating curve. And after much deliberation and discussion, and this was this is one of the controversies that uh, 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 Matt and Mark uh, Peters will, will um, discuss after this talk, um, the Delphi process uh, of the task force selected the lasso-based model to move forward to develop the criteria. So only four organ systems. The next important step was translating that lasso-based model with the four organ systems into something that we could actually use at the bedside. Tell was talking about uh, you know, the idea that with an integer model, somebody can just pick the, the, the criteria and um, do it at the, uh, the bedside of the patient in a piece of paper, whereas if we had put forth uh, consensus definitions that were machine learning coefficients and you know, weights, that would have been a little bit complicated. So we had to translate this machine learning model into something that was usable uh, uh, at the bedside. And so this was a translation that was done through uh, grid search, as I was mentioning. And the very uh, most important piece here, and uh, uh, I, I want to emphasize it, uh, is that when you're translating any machine learning model into something that's a little bit easier to use, uh, less complex, you always run the risk of really um, uh, sacrificing the performance of, uh, of something that's uh, more complex into something that's a little bit more straightforward, losing the performance. And maybe sometimes you're willing to sacrifice a little bit of the performance just for simplicity. We, what we were uh, happy to find out in the validation sets is that actually the area under the precision recall curve and the area under the receiver operating curve of the integer-based model, so the, the simpler uh, version of the model, was, uh, was very, uh, basically the same as the, the more complex uh, coefficient-based machine learning model. So uh, we were very happy with those results. And I guess this is the money shot. This is, uh, took four years and, um, you know, four years in timeline, probably 10 years in my longevity, and uh, tells uh, for 15 years of his longevity um, to, to generate. Um, and, it, and this is the basis of the criteria that we'll talk in the next couple of slides for, for the new criteria for sepsis and, and um, septic shock. I'm going to pause here for a, for a minute so people can look at it and start. Uh, you know, percolating all your questions that you may have. Uh, maybe we'll answer some of those before the end of this talk. But at the top, we have the respiratory dysfunction. This is based on the PSOFA score uh, at three levels. We have the cardiovascular dysfunction, which is uh, based on the PILOT2 and the count of vasoactive medications. Uh, so lactate and, and mineral pressure as well as vasoactives. Um, the coagulation dysfunction, which is based on the DIC score. And then the neurologic dysfunction, which is based on the PILOT2 neurologic dysfunction. Um, we then looked at the performance of the uh, Phoenix sepsis score in terms of the area under the precision recall curve. Um, uh, 
uh, and uh, we noticed that the, as we hoped in the validation sets, because we were tuning to this, uh, that the area in the precision recall curve was, uh, for the most part, better than all the other organ systems, uh, 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 scoring systems. Uh, most importantly, it was significantly better than the IPSCC, so the, 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 the existing 2005 criteria, which are represented there in the second column in the lighter blue col color, representing sort of lower performance compared to the Phoenix sepsis score. Um, and just as a of note, the, the top AUPRC that, that you saw was uh, 0.28 for higher resource settings. And just an example, in, those, in that setting, children with suspected infection have a mortality of less than 1%. So that performance is about, represents about 30 to 40 times better than the baseline, which is a really good uh, performance. And then in terms of the area and the re receiver operating curve, we're looking at performances of high 0.8 to 0.9 uh, area in the receiver operating curve to, to discriminate life-threatening organs function in children with, with infections, which I think is really, um, you know, a really remarkable performance. We looked at the calibration of the score. This is does the score increase, uh, does the mortality uh, associated with the increasing uh, 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 counts of points in the score, uh, is it in a linear fashion? And you can see here that, that, effective, that, it, that it does increase in a stepwise fashion across the range, and this is for higher resource settings. And then in lower resource settings, same thing, as the score increases, the mortality increases in a, in a sort of stepwise, uh, stepwise fashion. There on the right side, you'll see some empty slots. Those are uh, scores that were never achieved by some of the patients in lower resource settings, uh, since a lot of the mortality occurred at lower, uh, some of the lower scores. Um, finally, this is the, I guess, another of the money shots here for, for, for today's talk is the translation of the Phoenix sepsis score, this new organ dysfunction score that was uh, specifically designed for kids with suspected infection, translating that into uh, actual criteria for sepsis and septic shock. You'll notice that we don't use the terms severe sepsis anymore. It's been subsumed by sepsis, which is how we call it at the bedside, this life-threatening organ dysfunction uh, in kids with infections. And um, the task force, uh, through the Delphi process, selected uh, two or more points of the Phoenix sepsis score as the definition for sepsis, and then one uh, septic shock as uh, uh, sepsis with one or more cardiovascular points. There's a third category, uh, sepsis uh, with remote organ dysfunction that we will talk about a little bit more, which is also part of the uh, definitions that we're putting forth um, and uh, need further, uh, for, for further study. All right, so now in the final step, we're going to look at the performance, and as Tell was saying, now we're only looking at criteria that are binary, right? Do you have sepsis? Yes, no. Do you have septic shock? Yes, no. So the AUPRC doesn't make any sense anymore because it's not a score across a range. It's just a, a single threshold in that precision recall curve. So what we're looking now at is the positive predictive value on the y-axis and the sensitivity on the um, x-axis. And the points that you're seeing there in those figures uh, with, the, with the little cross, those are the, the, the positive predictive value sensitivity uh, balance for the different criteria. And the, the, the little lines are the 95% uh, confidence interval uh, for, e for each of the axes. And what we want to see is that these points are the closest as possible to the top right corner, as Tell was mentioning. Um, as you can see, the, for the first uh, panel on the left is for the outcome of death. Uh, the Phoenix sepsis criteria had higher uh, positive predictive value than the severe sepsis uh, based on IPSCC, the 2005 IPSCC criteria, and also higher positive predictive value than the serious based sepsis criteria, and um, higher sensitivity than the severe sepsis. On the uh, right side, you're seeing early ECMO, uh, sorry, early death, which is death within 72 hours of admission to the hospital, or the use of ECMO, which was the secondary outcome uh, in our study. This was uh, a secondary outcome that was put forth by the task force as a request for us to look at this secondary outcome. Uh, and as you can see there, the Phoenix sepsis criteria, again, has higher sensitivity and higher predictive, uh, pred positive predictive, predictive value than both the IPSCC severe sepsis and the uh, IPSCC severe sepsis cr uh, criteria. Uh, the next panel, we're looking at previously healthy kids. Uh, again, p the Phoenix sepsis criteria has higher positive predictive value, higher sensitivity than the IPCC criteria. And then on the right, we're looking at um, uh, patients with an ICU stay. And in the final two panels, we're looking at the lower resource uh, sites in the development set. Uh, in the, on the left, you have the lower resource site uh, one, uh, which again, we see the Phoenix sepsis criteria with uh, much improved performance over the IPCC criteria. And on the right, we're showing lower resource site two, which was also part of the development set. And the pro one problem we had with, with lower resource site two is that 
even though patients in that uh, uh, setting did receive uh, respiratory support, including mechanical ventilation, and they also had uh, neurologic exams, those did not get recorded in the clinical information systems and the databases that we had access to. So even though that, those things were happening, we, we did not have uh, ability to see that. So the performance in this, in this site for all the scores, including uh, the Phoenix sepsis score, were not um, uh, adequately represented because of the uh, missing that data. So we're, we're including here, we obviously included in the paper, and all the database for uh, uh, you know for transparency, but uh, really for the lower resource size performance, uh, we we uh, referred more to the lower resource site one as as the true performance in the sense that we did have access to all the data that they were um, all, all the variables that they were um, using in their in their care, including mechanical ventilation, uh, neurologic exam, etc. Just a, uh, the final slide, just a recap of how to interpret this figure because it's a little bit of a new way of looking at data. Um, uh, the uh, we want these points to be the closest to the top right corner, and we, uh, we look at the positive predictive value on the uh, y-axis and the sensitivity on the x-axis, and we also have to look at the reference uh, value of the dotted line at the bottom, as Tel was mentioning, which is the baseline rate of the outcome, in this case, mortality. And as you can see, in, in this case, uh, this is in previously healthy uh, kids in high resource settings, the Phoenix sepsis criteria has a 14 times better performance than the baseline rate um, uh, of the event. So extremely good performance. We're extremely excited to get these results um, after, the, after all the hard work. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna just talk about some of the things we wrestled with during this work. Uh, hopefully uh, to begin uh, the formulation of good questions in your minds for the round table and the Q&A afterwards. So first of all, why did we use existing organ dysfunction subcomponents in step one rather than starting from scratch? Um, and so I think this was highly consistent with the overall pragmatic approach that Scott and Loren mentioned in the first uh, set of talks. These scores uh, have already been validated in children and in many cases are already familiar to the community and in use in various settings in the community. And we wanted to develop criteria that people would use and could use effectively in a wide variety of environments. If they were already familiar with some of the pieces, then we thought that that was more likely. That, so this was a really a pragmatic choice. So we broke apart that table at the bottom, found the best um, options, and put them back together. So why did we use stacked regression in step two? Um, so this was a very natural methodologic approach given that we were using existing organ dysfunction subcomponents. Each subcomponent would, would get its own weight in the sepsis model. Um, there are statistical guarantees that I promise I will not go into um, that the final model would be at least as accurate as the individual, as the best individual subcomponents. And so stacked regression is often seen as having some of the benefits of deep learning, where each unit has a weight that's optimized, but it's still highly interpretable. We know exactly what's in each of those subcomponents, and we know exactly what the impact of that individual subcomponent is on the overall prediction. So um, we knew that it would be controversial that in the end, uh, the decision was made based on the results, not that um, renal and hepatic dysfunction are not present in the sepsis criteria. Does this mean that renal and hepatic dysfunction are not important at all? It does not mean that. What it, those are extremely important for the management and stratification and, and other purposes in the care of children with sepsis. What it means is that we were able to be efficient and so perhaps to make it more likely that these criteria could be used in more austere environments because we found that we could get equivalent sepsis diagnosis only using the four organ systems. Um, and so we knew that the eight organ system model based on that larger ridge uh, machine learning model that Nelson mentioned would potentially be useful for some uh, perhaps research uses and, and other things. And so we made it available in the supplement along with a comprehensive analysis using the same metrics. And for um, reference, the uh, eight organ system uh, score, the Phoenix eight score, uh, in addition to the four organ systems we've mentioned, also includes endocrine, immunologic, renal, and hepatic dysfunction. So getting back to that question of remote organ dysfunction, put another way, can a, a, a child with single organ respiratory or neurologic dysfunction have sepsis? And so I phrase it that way because the, 
those are the elements of the Phoenix sepsis score by which a child could achieve two points, the two points required for a sepsis diagnosis, in addition to cardiovascular. I think everyone would agree that cardiovascular dysfunction is remote from the site of infection in almost all cases. But what about that single organ a child with pneumonia or terrible viral, viral infection of the, of the respiratory system requiring them to require mechanical ventilation? And so the answer is yes, they would qualify under the, the Phoenix sepsis criteria. However, the way that we looked at this with the task force is using these diagrams that were affectionately referred to as the eggs. Um, and uh, what we learned is that, in fact, nearly all kids who qualify with Phoenix sepsis have remote organ dysfunction. So that red in the middle of the egg are the children with Phoenix sepsis who have organ dysfunction that is remote from the site of infection. And the blue rim uh, are the children with Phoenix sepsis who do not have organ dysfunction remote from the site of infection. It is true that the kids in the blue rim do have lower mortality, both at high resource sites on the left side of the slide and low resource sites on the right side of the slide. And that's something that we present more completely in the supplement. So what if a healthcare facility doesn't routinely collect all the variables in the Phoenix sepsis score? And some of the coagulation testing like D-dimer is a good example. So according to the international survey, most of the variables, most of the elements in the Phoenix sepsis score are available in most settings uh, around the world. However, the score is built with redundancy in mind, and this was part of the pragmatism. Uh, in order to get a sepsis diagnosis, it only takes two points. The median score for children with sepsis was three, um, with an interquartile range of two to four. But the Phoenix sepsis score itself goes up into the teens. And so what that means is there are lots of ways to get two points. And we think that's why that even at a, um, a site that doesn't routinely clinically collect coagulation tests and lactate levels, the score functioned really well because those kids with sepsis were achieving two points in, in other ways. So in comparison with the adult sepsis three process um, and, and sort of the way that team worked, similarities include that sepsis use the same conceptual framework. Sepsis is infection and organ dysfunction. We use large EHR-based data sets to derive and validate the new criteria. Differences include, as Nelson mentioned, the pediatric uh, data set was larger, more diverse, more international, and included uh, more higher and lower resource sites. We used AUPRC and positive predictive value and sensitivity as primary measures instead of AUROC. And we used organ dysfunction subcomponents instead of complete existing scores like SOFA. So limitations, uh, electronic health record data, of course, has missingness and errors. We mitigated this as best as possible using a robust and reproducible harmonization and data quality process. I mentioned the GitHub uh, repository at the beginning of my uh, first talk. Um, I'd encourage you to check that out if you're, you're interested. Um, and this is, in some sense, also an advantage. This is real world data. This, this is the data as it is represented in sites um, that may implement these criteria. And so these are the, the source data that those criteria may be computed on in the future. So it's a bit of, of pragmatism in that as well. Some organ dysfunction is, as measured by things like GCS, um, is iatrogenic. So GCS in intubated and sedated patients is an example there. That's a limitation we acknowledge. Also a bit of a real world data uh, piece of pragmatism. Some lower resource sites had important measures, as Nelson mentioned, that were not recorded even when they were performed for the patient. So some, in some cases, kids received mechanical ventilation, but it wasn't in uh, the data that are in their clinical information system that we could access. We did not distinguish acute from chronic organ dysfunction, same decision that the sepsis three folks had to make. And our data are from 2010 to 2019 from most sites. And so uh, we will need to look forward uh, and re reassess and revalidate uh, the, the data in the post-COVID world. Next steps include the need for early identification and screening tools for possible sepsis, validation in hospital-acquired sepsis, as I mentioned earlier. And we are actively developing clinical decision support tools appropriate for use in high-resource environments, so tools that are run in your EHRs. Um, as well as uh, mobile uh, tools for use in lower resource environments. So it, uh, we really want to provide an enormous thanks uh, to SCCM, to our funders, uh, the many collaborators in this work, the members of the task force, and I want to offer a special call out to the core data science team for this work that I lead at the University of Colorado, Peter DeWitt, Seth Russell, and Meg Rabol. Thank you very much. <laughs>
right, so after the very exciting presentation of, of really mind-blowing work, and as, as Nelson has highlighted, which beats any other clinical database out there, we want to hear more about the controversies during that process, you know, which was very, very productive, but not always smooth. And, um, you know, how can we learn from this? And so it is my pleasure for the next um, part of the session to have Matt Wins from the Global Institute from the uh, University of Vancouver, um, who's been working in Uganda as well for a long time, and Mark Peters from the University of London, and to tell us more about actually some of the things, you know, which um, were, where we struggled with. Can we please change to the other set of slides? Good morning, it's uh, a pleasure to be here today to talk with you a little bit about some of the controversies that we encountered during the process of developing these new uh, sepsis criteria. I have uh, no relevant disclosures. I was part of the, uh, the, um, a, a, the grant that was mentioned earlier by Talon and Nelson. So we've already discussed a little bit uh, by way of introduction around the task force and the development of these, uh, these criteria, but I wanted to sort of re-emphasize um, um, a point, which is that this task force included 35 individuals from a very vast uh, uh, um, uh, uh, area of the world. Uh, so we had people from 12 different countries, uh, six different continents, um, and, and uh, ultimately a vast uh, um, uh, diverse set of experiences and expertise. So it's, it's no surprise then that controversy would, would be um, uh, a big component um, of the development of these uh, criteria. Um, we've already discussed a little bit about some of this uh, with regards to the international survey and the systematic review, which have helped to contextualize where some of these controversies might point us. Um, and then even within our own group, uh, um, it was known that we had to make some key decisions um, um, around certain uh, um, um, elements of these controversies, and we developed a, a criteria, uh, which is the, the, the Delphi process to determine uh, how these, uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, 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 um, uh, uh, criteria could be ultimately uh, um, made. Um, I, I want to point out that the controversies um, were, were indeed fostered by the leadership, and I think this made the criteria stronger in the end. Um, and um, our, our paper has a, a supplement which includes a lot of the details around the controversies, and I'd encourage you to go look there. Um, I'm just going to talk about uh, a few uh, points um, and uh, give you a little bit of a taste of some of the issues that we dealt with. So I think we can divide the controversies into sort of stage one and stage two controversies. So the stage one controversies were predefined by the leadership um, and were part of the discussions we had in Salzburg back in 2019. So um, of these, uh, some key ones included, for example, uh, the conceptual definition of sepsis, which was already touched on earlier. Um, also um, among the topics of discussion was uh, how to operationalize the uh, criteria of infection, which has also been a little bit uh, 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 mentioned. Um, how to define shock? Um, are we looking for a sensitive criteria or a specific criteria? Uh, what about sepsis phenotypes? Can we include different phenotypes or are we going to have a single criteria? And then the age range. Are we going to capture neonates in our criteria or not? Um, and then of course issues around the stages of sepsis, uh, early, uh, screening, uh, severe, etc. Uh, and then what is the ideal outcome uh, to be used in the criteria development. Are we looking for um, mortality or mods, or what is the ideal outcome? And then uh, the, the, the issue of high versus resource, uh, and then there was the, and then there was the issue of high versus low resource settings. Are we looking to have separate criteria or the same criteria uh, for both of these uh, uh, areas? Um, in the next stage, which is really the stage um, over the past year during the data phase. Um, we had to discuss issues around which organ criteria to use, which, which was outlined earlier by uh, Tell and Nelson. Um, how do we consider interventions? Are they also um, eligible to be used as criteria? Um, of course, one of the big issues was, was, was the issue around model parsimony. Are we uh, thinking more about uh, the criteria as a, as a, a, as a prediction tool um, or explainability? And there's a natural tension there. What about the types of sepsis um, and severity? This was readdressed during these last I, I, um, a, a few months of model development. And then again, the issues of high versus low resource was, had, was, 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 was an important area that uh, required uh, uh, quite a bit of discussion. Um, issues around remote organ dysfunction was already mentioned, and then uh, the screening um, uh, criteria as well. So the first criteria that I'll touch on is the issue of, the, uh, of high and low income settings. 
Um, and uh, ultimately, our desire was to have a globally relevant criteria, uh, and this um, was something that we had to think about carefully uh, in the development process. So if we look at under five death as a proxy for sepsis, because unfortunately there just isn't a good uh, um, data source to capture sepsis prevalence and mortality in the global south, uh, we can see here that the, the primary area where sepsis occurs is in the global south. Um, and if we contrast this where, where the, where the, where the and if we contrast this with the resources and the distribution of resources using physician distribution as a proxy, again, the issue is that there is no data, um, good data on metrics for resources. We can see that the distribution of resources and the prevalence of sepsis and mortality um, is, is, is not ideally suited to where the disease occurs. Um, and this really uh, informed a lot of our discussions about how do we make criteria that is applicable to all settings. So in terms of some of the specifics, so um, it was important to discuss the issue of, of, of the availability of variables. Um, so are the variables included in the criteria going to be available in all settings or in the majority of settings? And then of course the issue around validation, are we gonna build criteria that are validated in the settings where they could be used? And of course, um, given the disparity um, in, in both mortality and resources, how do we operationalize these criteria in a multitude of settings? So in order to mitigate at least some of these, um, we sought from the get-go to uh, bring in data from low-income settings, which was not an easy uh, feat. Um, and we did get some data, um, but one of the issues that we um, see is the issue of of data poverty um, in, in low resource settings, and it was very hard to find high quality data. As we've already heard, there was uh, lots of missingness in these regions. Um, it was a goal to develop criteria that were simple um, and could be easily implemented uh, so they could be used in these settings. Um, and we did have some qualitative work uh, where we did focus group discussions and key informant interviews with end users and, 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 and other experts to better understand the pathway for implementation in these settings. And this ultimately helped guide uh, some of the decision making around these criteria. So the other issue um, that I want to bring up is the issue of parsimony. And this was also mentioned earlier a little bit uh, by Talon Nelson. Uh, there's this natural tension uh, that we see between um, simplicity and explainability. Um, and uh, we saw this uh, with the four versus eight organ criteria. Um, and we also see this with the uh, issue between low and high income uh, country criteria. Um, ultimately, we recognize uh, that um, we used a predictive approach um, and this um, uh, is uh, not always going to provide the most explainability in a criteria. Uh, but I think in the end it produced a criteria that's cross-cutting uh, across uh, different uh, geographies from which the data was uh, captured. Uh, and um, I think this allows for a more um, feasible adoption um, across various global settings uh, and, uh, and, and hopefully more collaborative research across these settings as well. So I'll pass it off to Mark now. Uh, oh, actually, one more slide. Um, I wanted to give a taste of the Delphi process. So um, for a lot of the, the controversies, um, we had voting, and that was mentioned earlier. And this is an example of the voting uh, that was done for the four versus eight organ criteria. Uh, so you can see here that the, uh, on the upper uh, row, uh, which is the eight organ system, um, it was generally acceptable by the task force to have that, but it was more preferable to have the simpler one. And I think this then led to um, the adoption of a, uh, a unified criteria for high and low settings because um, it was already as simple as it was gonna get. And then we had very high agreement for the high versus low resource criteria uh, being the same. Um, so that's the taste of, of my piece and I'll pass it off to Mark. Thanks very much. <laughs> so um, some of us who were invited to um, join the task force um, took the view that our role, we, without machine learning or huge database expertise, that our role was to ask, ask the difficult questions. And um, I consider myself one of those people because when we first started, I think I said at one of the calls, I'm not sure sepsis is a thing. I should have probably been kicked off the call. Um, I think it's a thousand different things. And, and so I've, I've got two examples of a controversy, one that was prior to set up and one sort of um, in face of the results. And so 
they're both sort of heterogeneity issues. And this is the first one, early versus late as a cause of heterogeneity. And it, this is um, just an excuse for me to show one of our old papers from nearly 10 years ago. But this has a key of this slide, okay? This, this is a survival curve for children in blue and with no com comorbidity and um, a, a diagnosis of sepsis referred to our transport team. And in red, for children with a previous comorbidity, bad enough for them to be in hospital in the last year. And the point is that in the first 48 hours or so, they die at the same rate. But then something different happens, and their cumulative mortality um, separates dramatically. And so um, to try and predict across these two um, situations is, is really problematic. There's a real signal-to-noise issue if you're looking at late mortality. In, in other words, there are multiple ways you can die in the context of infection. And this is one of the possible limitations of sepsis 3. There's this circular argument that risk of death is the definition. So if you died, you had sepsis, and you can go round and round that little loop. And I would argue that that first group um, have sepsis as a clearly causal link, but for their sepsis, in legal speak, they would not have died. The second group, those in red who are dying after 48 hours, maybe, maybe the infection is a marker of their general debility, um, and they're dying of their acute myeloid leukemia, which renders them vulnerable to um, the infection. So could we really expect something to, to predict across those two sets of criteria? And we can characterize that as early versus late. Um, the team put me in my place about this, because actually when they did a sensitivity analysis of the data, cutting it by early and late, the performance is almost identical. So I can be quiet about that. Okay, the next one still stands, though. Um, and this is the issue of intervention as criteria. Okay, some, some of us are less is more intensivists, some of us are more is more intensivists, perhaps depending on your billing system. Oh, that's not too sceptical, sorry. Um, so, I'm very jet-lagged, the British, the British um, attitude is different. Okay, um, so in these criteria, there are at least three points which relate to the level of um, intervention. And so, that's kind of complex because Imagine I'm on call. This is supposed to represent me um, at short notice. Okay. Um, and we're offering relatively little support to this patient. But if the same child had been admitted under my fellow, it's quite possible they would have been less tolerant, <laughs> less tolerant of the um, uh, respiratory dysfunction and maybe of that haemoglobin and maybe they'd add a, uh, add a vasopressor also. The physiology would be the same, but the physician has altered the score by virtue of their um, threshold for intervention. And this then links into this point about remote sepsis because sedating for ventilating would be a, an organ failure outside of the original site of infection. And it's super appealing, this idea of remote sepsis, because it sort of captures something that I think we all innately believe, that something systemic is core to um, uh, our view of what sepsis is. But it's very difficult to pick out if we all have different thresholds for intervening, and we're using intervening as the um, characteristic uh, for defining. So, so that remains a problem. But despite that, we've got a score that outperforms anything that's existed um, up until this point, and we should recognise that. So our conclusion, then, is that I think these these criteria are tempered by the white heat of the discussion we had at some of these meetings, and that they were pretty meaty. Um, uh, they persist. I, mean, I think it's fair to say that controversy was encouraged um, in an attempt to temper this. Um, I think the final criteria capture some of the true, the, the, the true variability, whether that's pathophysiological or geographic um, or therapeutic. And we can finish with Francis Bacon. If a man is content to start with certainties, he can, uh, he ends with doubt, the other way around. And if he, if he starts with doubt, he will finish with certainties. So I think that should reflect what's um, happened here. Thank you. Our last talk today is uh, from Anatin Carroll, who's going to be talking about operationalizing the criteria. So I'm, I'm presenting today on behalf of the task force. And um, <clears throat> to conclude, um, just some considerations about how we operationalize a new score. So my disclosures, I have some research collaborations with the following companies listed here, but all the funding goes to my employer and not to myself. So we've heard from the previous speakers 
uh, about the variability in presentation. And when a child presents with suspected uh, sepsis, um, they represent a continuum which goes from undifferentiated febrile illness through to um, infection, um, organ dysfunction, and death. And so they present on this trajectory, um, um, and we, we, it's difficult to define. Added to that, sepsis is used synony synonymously with uh, infection, which leads to difficulties in measuring uh, disease burden, as we've heard in optimizing uh, management, recruitment to trials, uh, and, and compromises quality improvement initiatives. But the Phoenix sepsis score, which you've heard about today, allows us to define children with life-threatening organ dysfunction due to infection. And that can be operationalized across different geographical settings. And, it, and in this respect, as we've heard earlier, context is everything. And so these criteria must be applicable across all the global settings in which these children present. So they uh, need to be sensitive enough, and we've seen that uh, in the data presented, uh, but also specific enough. They need to be flexible enough, and we've seen the pragmatic approach that was taken with the development of the score, including um, the redundancy that's built into the, um, uh, the score, as well as the parsimonious approach, which allows for that flexibility and adapt adaptability across global settings. And then the score must correlate with biologically re relevant phenotypes uh, so that we can identify those patients with organ dysfunction that would benefit from specific therapies. So this um, is a, a infographic from a manuscript which uh, uh, we uh, published last year and goes through the different considerations uh, that uh, we, we developed in operationalization. So I'll go through those in turn, looking at the biology, the epidemiology, uh, the timing, uh, resources, and access. Firstly, the biology. Um, in the different settings in which children present globally, represented in the huge data sets that we use to, divide, to derive the score, we have different manifestations from pathogens that are different in adults and children. A good example of that is RSV and SARS-CoV-2, COV where the same virus manifests differently in adults and children. And the pathogens responsible are different in high-income high versus low-income countries, for example, malaria, uh, non-typhoidal salmonella. And of course, there are non-bacterial pathogens which present uh, like sepsis, uh, like dengue, uh, enterovirus. And we've heard about some co-infections and comorbidities, which also influence uh, the host response. Added to that, uh, endemicity and seasonality increase suspicion of uh, underlying etiology. So there are also some other underlying predisposing factors, immunodeficiencies, uh, malnutrition, co-infection, uh, as well as genetic polymorphisms. We saw in the data presented that there was an impressive spread of age from neonates right through to adolescents, and that's one of the complexities of pediatrics compared to adults in that children don't come in one size. There's also underlying comorbidities like prematurity, low birth weight, uh, and children and infants under a year, uh, w w which present major risk factors for sepsis and poor outcome. And so the data development of the score had to take into account all of these considerations. We know that uh, infants and young children uh, have lesser reserves to compensate because of their ability to maintain blood pressure. Therefore, this leaves a much smaller opportunity, a uh, window of opportunity to intervene. Then, of course, there's uh, existing therapies and vaccine-preventable infections, which have almost virtually disappeared from high-income countries, some of which may be present still in some low- and middle-income settings. Uh, antimicrobial resistant infections are highly prevalent in some low mi and middle income settings due to uh, poor regulation with um, drugs and, and antimicrobials and also with um, quality control of antimicrobials. The antimicrobials themselves may be um, affected by other drugs such as drugs for t treating TB, uh, rifampicin, uh, dehydration uh, due to gastrointestinal illness. And with advancing technologies, immune-modulating drugs, such as steroids and monoclonals, may also increase susceptibility uh, to severe infection. 
Next, we looked at uh, epidemiology. And again, as you've seen from the data, we were able to capture this from a wide range of geographies, globally and settings, north and south. Uh, and that seasonality also affects the uh, presentations, uh, winter presentations in the temperate climates, uh, and uh, rainy season in, in low and middle income countries. And of course, there's a meningitis belt across the middle of uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And then some pathogens which are present in other uh, low and middle income countries are rarely seen in, in, north, in, in, in high income countries. And presentation is also affected by uh, uh, factors like climate change, uh, uh, war, uh, floods and droughts, and also uh, wars and uh, other crises. And then we also looked at, uh, at timing of presentation, and we've heard a lot about this from the previous speakers. When high income settings, we have presentations uh, to the primary care or to the ED, predominantly of uh, worried well uh, patients and, and uh, early presentations re requiring observation. They're often very highly skilled staff, easy access to critical care and outreach. Uh, and, and on the contrary, in low income settings, these are often in remote uh, locations with late presentations because uh, children first have to present a local health center and then are transported to a centralized facility and there may be delays with transport, which means by the time they, they present to a critical care facility, uh, there's established organ dysfunction uh, and a high mortality. So finally, I'll talk about resources and access. And one of the considerations we had was that it wasn't just about high income and low income, but about the resources available to a particular facility when a child presents. We heard earlier on in the open uh, ceremony about um, marginalized populations in high income countries which are remote uh, and for whom there is often a delay in accessing critical care. The uh, uh, low income settings tend to have high patient load, limited skilled expertise, and limited resources in terms of drugs and organ support, uh, in contrast to the high income setting with skilled expertise uh, and, 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 and high resources. And of course, the, the criteria uh, can be incorporated into electronic patient algorithms, uh, which makes uh, them data rich as compared to uh, low income settings. So finally, we ended up with some uh, new considerations, which I won't uh, go through the um, but are listed in detail in the paper, but I'll just highlight a couple. And they are that developing the minimum variable data sets allows uh, the sort of collaboration that we've heard about this morning uh, for, the, for new criteria to be validated uh, and, and, and to be um, used uh, for further research um, and uh, progress. Additionally, um, clinical decision support uh, systems can be used, the criteria can be incorporated into electronic patient records in high income settings or mobile devices in uh, mobile phones in lower income settings to allow these uh, criteria to be operationalized. Uh, and finally, the development of uh, affordable diagnostics could then help with the risk stratification uh, of sepsis wherever children present. So in conclusion, I hopefully this morning we've um, outlined some of the challenges and opportunities in operationalizing sepsis. The Phoenix sepsis score is operationalized with a score of two or more and septic shock with sepsis with organ dysfunction. Uh, some challenges remain in that the score is not designed to identify children at risk of developing sepsis or um, uh, children who have early uh, infection, uh, but we, we we hope that this score can help us to identify and manage those children with life-threatening organ dis dysfunction wherever they present. The score that we've presented this morning are um, unambiguous and flexible, and they're designed to be used in a, in a wide variety of contexts so that they can be implemented locally. So I'd like to acknowledge all the co-authors on the manuscript as well as all the members of the uh, Pediatric Sepsis Definition Task Force, and thank you for your attention. So um, thank you so much. So in the last 90 minutes, we've essentially um, gone through what we've done in the last five years. And with that, we would now uh, really like to open for questions in the public. Um, I can invite you know, people with questions to come forward to the microphones. We have a number of questions as well to discuss here in the round table. And uh, Scott and me would like to um, have all the presenters actually join us up here on the podium. <clears throat>
Yeah, so if you have questions, you know, please come forward. Yeah. You, you can find both papers and two editorials on them as well. One um, which by Erin Cartel and team, which very nicely summarizes essentially what has been done. Um, they're currently you know, live on Dharma. Yes, please. Thank you for that uh, most uh, exciting 90 minutes. I'm a sepsis nerd as a recovering hospitalist. Uh, curious about your recommendations on uh, universal sepsis screening in pediatrics, in the primary care, ED, inpatient setting. Like, what are your thoughts around that? Do we go out, print off the sepsis screening, and then hand them out to our nurses? And some guidance around that would be great. Thank you. I can start and I'll pass it to Halden. Uh, I think that, that the just to be clear, so the uh, um, the, the definition that we uh, that we're putting the criteria we're putting forth today is to meet the you know five of the six things that everybody wanted, right? So this is for benchmarking, this is for correct diagnosis, this is for epidemiological surveillance, and this is for uh, enrollment in clinical trials, um, and, and for um, you know for clinical management in the patients with established uh, uh, sepsis. Uh, this is not for early recognition or for the screening. Uh, there was a lot of discussion around uh, us putting forth something in that realm, and I think that's still part of our uh, hope for the for the future. Uh, for now, what we've discussed is we need to still rely on the local expertise to develop your own screening protocols. Uh, perhaps using this as the outcome when you're a benchmark, you know, you're evaluating the performance of your screening tools using the definition of sepsis as the outcome that you're looking at. Uh, so that's the use case there. Uh, but but really rely on on the local expertise and uh, because of the you know high variability of the patients that you may be taking care of, um, you know, the setting where you're practicing. And so for now, as we put it in the paper, uh, this is still uh, reliant on, on the local um, uh, settings, but I'll, I'll, I'll pass it to Halden. Yeah, I think trying to find a screening tool that works for pediatric sepsis has been the project of many people, many research groups for many, many years, and that wasn't solved yet today. We took a step forward by having an agreement on the outcome. What is the thing we are looking for? Um, an important difference from what happened when sepsis 3 came out for adults was that SIRS had actually worked fairly well with limitations, but worked fairly well for screening in the pre-ICU setting for adults. PEDS SIRS never worked for kids, um, and the data, it was worse than it was for adults. So saying that it's time to sunset SIRS for kids isn't leaving us without a screening tool. It's leaving us in the same situation we were, which is we didn't have one, we still don't have one. But now we agree what the outcome is and we can move forward with our research with a more parsimonious definition to try to find in the future. Maybe holding in that context, you now have access to the largest database ever in the field to, and um, to what point actually does this now allow to tackle this question in a different way to, to before? I think we look forward to taking advantage of this um, amazing data resource. Hi, Lauren, thank you. Great work. My question is regarding your exclusion of renal AKI from, from the four criteria you have used. And my concept is that your criteria you have used, your podium, your payload, your prism, and PIM, they're all evoluted over time. Similarly, your definition of AKI has undergone evolution from P-Rifle to Akin to KDGO. So when you looked at the significance of these events in each of these, these criteria, did you take into account what was the contribution of the changing AKI paradigm in this uh, group? So that's a great question. We used the most updated versions of each organ dysfunction score. And it's true that those organ dysfunction scores were developed over time with, with different targets. Um, but I do want to emphasize that we did not exclude renal and hepatic dysfunction from relevance in the context of pediatric sepsis. We just found that we could make a choice of efficiency, that we did not lose the ability to diagnose sepsis, you only, a decision you only have to make once, versus multiple decisions over time about how you take care of that patient going forward. 
in the context of that one decision about whether or not the child has sepsis, we found that we only needed the four organ systems. So I, I think that's a really important point that I hope came across in the, in the data. Okay, thank you. So um, we really invite you in the, um, the manuscript from, from Nelson and team to look at the supplement where this detailed Phoenix 8 score is listed. Um, and it's really important to grasp that the, the preference of the four organ dysfunction score was because the, um, the precision and you know the, as well as the sensitivity was as, as good as with the four organs than with eight organs, including kidneys and liver. So essentially this does not mean that renal dysfunction or liver dysfunction should not be looked at. It means that our ability to predict death actually is as good as with four organs as it is with eight organs. Hi, Rob Patterson. I'm from uh, Pensacola, pediatric intensivist. Thanks you and congratulations on fantastic uh, body of work. The definition of sepsis is, is, I think, is a milestone and very important for all of us. And and with all the limitations and st controversies, it's still a, a fantastic definition. In the last five years, those of us in clinical practice have seen a blurring of definition as we place it into our medical charting at the behest of payers and <coughs> administrators trying to capture better uh, monetary uh, gains for our institutions, which have relied on definitions of sepsis, which have been vague and have been inclusive of things that some of us in intensive care have felt like this is definitely not sepsis, this is definitely not respiratory failure as I understand it, but it's required for our, our, our payment. Did that discussion at all enter into your uh, discussion as you went through here, how this might affect the, the, the economic of pediatric critical care as we define sepsis and payers take on this definition versus what we have traditionally used as sepsis? Thanks. We leave it to the many American colleagues on the task force <laughs> to respond to this. Uh, we, ac we actually did not uh, discuss that. And it was not a consideration, but it's, a, it's an important point. Um, given that the criteria were developed using the electronic medical record, you can imagine that they would be easier to pull out and less reliant on our using the words if, if a coder wants to understand that. And, and actually, frankly, tools are being developed to, to extract those inf that information from the medical record. I don't know if anybody has anything else. You know, I, I, I agree that we didn't use uh, the reimbursement issue at all in the decision making around these, these criteria. But I think by virtue of limiting the term to children with life-threatening infection, what we put on our problem list will now align more closely with what we believe as clinicians. And so I, I, I feel better about that. Hi, uh, Matt Taylor from Cohen. Cohen Children's in New York. I wonder if you could comment on the uh, specificity of the score in younger, like the youngest age group. I'm, we've all seen there's differences in mortality and everything over age, and I wonder if this can be applied to real, like newborns, and whether it's as good um, at that sort of the extreme of age. Yeah, that, that's a key uh, key question. So we do have uh, the performance break, broken down by age groups in the in the main paper. It's actually one of the supplemental tables. Uh, we saw that the performance was actually very good across all age groups, including even the zero to one month uh, uh, age group, which, um, as a recap, is the uh, kids who uh, were term uh, and returned to the hospital for acute care, uh, and, and those who had the suspected infection, th those are the ones that we studied for the definition of sepsis. So these are not premature kids. This is not like late onset sepsis after birth kind of thing. Um, 
uh, unless they were coming back. Um, so uh, the performance in that uh, in that age group was really good, as well as for the six month olds and for the one year olds. And I invite you to to look at that in the in the supplement. Their mort their baseline mortality is also higher, as you probably know, for sepsis. Um, so that we also uh, sort of corroborated that. Were there any differences in the sub scores or anything like that? Just out of curiosity. We actually had, did not look uh, specifically at what the differences were of the subcomponents, but um, thank you. That's another paper we can write. <laughs> and, and I'll just add that uh, they um, performed really well in the babies in both high and low resource yes. settings, which I think is really important. There certainly were low resource settings where the babies were the predominance um, of, the, of the cohort. Maybe it's worth to just highlight this a bit more explicitly, you know, what type of newborns were included and what type of newborns were not included because, you know, in 2016 as pedi pediatric intensivists and you know, pediatric physicians, we realized the gap in terms of sepsis 3 about pediatric age groups and I think it's, it, it would be great to hear from you guys as well which gaps exist now in terms of preterm newborns. Uh, so, so we excluded birth hospitalizations if the child was still in the hospital after being born in the hospital um, and had suspected infection. That patient was not included in the in the analysis. Uh, and if the patient was um, uh, still had not reached 37 weeks post conceptional age, so if they were a premature baby that was born at you know 28 weeks and they were three weeks old, he would they would be uh, not would not qualify for that. If it was a premature baby that uh, had gone home and you know, was now, you know, six months of age and came back to the hospital, that would, that patient would qualify for, for the criteria, uh, for the analysis and would be included, was included in the, in the analysis. Uh, but, but those who are still premature um, or um, were uh, still in the hospital after being born in the hospital were not included in the analysis. And I think that's an important gap on the lower end that I think we're, hopefully uh, we had Jim Wen was one of our uh, members of the task force. He's a neonatologist, uh, uh, sepsis uh, expert. And I think a part of that, the, the, uh, his role of being part of the task force was hopefully uh, to sort of set the stage and uh, for, for the next development of neonatal sepsis criteria that hopefully will be forthcoming. Um, and on the upper end, we limited to 18 years of age. Um, obviously, the, the, where we stop calling patients pediatric and start calling them adult um, changes from uh, setting to setting. Uh, and certainly in, in, large, in international sites, oftentimes pediatric care skews more towards the uh, toddlers and, and school, uh, you know, younger school age children as opposed to the older um, adolescents. But uh, just to be sort of more comprehensive, we went from, from that uh, non preemie uh, uh, on the lower end to 18 years of age for our inclusion. Um, thank you. This is a phenomenal effort. Um, Ram Narayan from London. My question is more about the data that you've used to um, derive some the Phoenix core in terms of the timing. Because clearly under 24 hours, you could have several, you know, many, say 24 even readings of physiological vital signs, probably maybe one or two sets of blood tests that you might use. So did you use the first set, the worst readings? And the reason I ask this is because children obviously when they come in may not fulfill the definition of sepsis, but within six hours, they might. Um, so that's one question. I suppose second comment is about face validity of the Phoenix score. I think we've talked a lot about single organ respiratory failure will satisfy the criteria for the Phoenix score. That wouldn't really satisfy face validity. If you ask a clinician, is this sepsis? I doubt people would say this is sepsis. So just your thoughts on how you could improve the face validity of it. Okay, so maybe we start with the first one. And so the, um, the short answer to the first question is that we used the worst in, in 24 hours. And that decision was intentional uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, for capture uh, related to the heterogeneity of frequency of measurement at the different sites. Um, and also because we built these uh, criteria in, with the plan to disseminate them as computational tools in mind. And so we recognize that we really want these criteria to be measured dynamically, to be measured multiple times. And we want to be able to, um, in the future, look at how the trajectories um, of the scores and the criteria relate to, to ultimate outcome. Um, but we felt that the best summary measure to use at this point uh, was the worst. 
And I think my colleague, Dr. Hall, addressed the second question. So, so the, the issue of, of face validity was the subject of some discussion <laughs> within uh, the task force. Um, and so I would say that in the end, uh, face validity is in the eye of the beholder. And I think this approach, focusing on a life-threatening infection, has more face validity than the prior definition in which sepsis could be uh, uh, term sepsis could be applied to a child on the ward who's playing. Now, having said that, I think that the, the work of the committee uh, provides a framework in the manuscript and in the supplements for the use of multiple different interpretations of the term uh, sepsis for your purposes. We've heard that if you wish in, to use the sepsis eight criteria for your research or quality improvement purposes, you can. Those criteria are, are, are there and they're published in the supplement. If you wish to use uh, the population of patients who have organ dysfunction that is remote from the site of infection as your target of research, as your target of Q, uh, for QI interventions, you can. Uh, the, the, the actual organ dysfunction criteria are, are the same. So I would say that there is face validity to the, the work that we have done. It's simply in how you choose to use it. Just, a quick just one, one counter to there, to the, to the point of the respiratory dysfunction. To meet uh, sepsis criteria just by respiratory dysfunction, this children has to be on mechanical ventilation and have a PF ratio less than 200 uh, due to an infection. And I think, you know, from a face validity standpoint, I think most people will say, yeah, that's a life-threatening infection, uh, and even if they don't have any other organ dysfunction. The reality, though, that's the face validity piece. The reality is when you look at the data, very, very few kids have meet that criteria and don't have any of the other organ dysfunctions. So it's very rare that you have sort of this ARDS type uh, infection uh, with a very low PF ratio, mechanical ventilation, and you don't meet any of the other criteria. So I think that, that it, and not just the GCS for sedation, but I mean, many of, many of these kids are impressors, many of these kids have uh, um, coagulation dysfunction, uh, et cetera. So I think that, that you know, that for, was reassuring to us. We even looked at a subset of the patients who had RS, only RSV as their diagnosis and whether they, um, what, what was their outcome if we looked at the respiratory dysfunction. Uh, it, it was a very small group of patients, but that very small group of patients had a really high mortality. So these were really, really sick uh, RSV patients with multiple organ dysfunction, mechanically ventilated. And, you know, I, I would also think from a face validity standpoint, we would call that sepsis, uh, viral sepsis. And uh, um, so, Hopefully that, that, that answers that question. So Ram, I think you've asked the key question, okay, because you're revealing what your prior belief is about sepsis, that it's something systemic. Whereas if we use either the 2005 definition or sepsis three, being at risk of death from infection is sufficient to call it sepsis. And, we, and so trying to match those two things is, was probably the biggest challenge we faced. And the discussion about remote organ failure was largely about trying to characterize that systemic element of it. And I think we've partially got there. I think you have to acknowledge that your RSV on a ventilator would meet that criteria and actually would meet criteria for remote organ dysfunction if you have to sedate that child to a GCS of less than 10 to keep them on a ventilator. So, you know, that's, that is one of the limitations. But remember where we started from. I'd be keen as well to hear from the ED perspective, you know, what, what is the perception on face validity of these constructs um, for an ED physician? I, I think the idea of organ dysfunction in the setting of infection has had face validity. I think we, I appreciate the efficiency of the four criteria um, in finding a population that when we look at the non-ICU setting is far, far sicker than everyone else. Um, I think we too would wonder, you know, what happened to acute kidney injury, and as has been stated many times by this group, it still matters, it's still something we'll attend to, but when we need to pull a sepsis case, whether it's for research, whether it's for quality improvement, it will be useful having this more parsimonious definition to work with. Um, and then if you need to find a really, really sick group or a systemic group, all of the criteria exist in the manuscript for use. I think some of the ED considerations for implementation as you get into the nitty gritty, things like the mean arterial pressure may be less um, often recorded. Um, how does it work in a non-invasive cuff versus a um, arterial line? And how will 
more pragmatic, something you could implement in an ambulance where you might be using a manual cuff, what will the translation of this into other kinds of measurements mean? Um, and that's work we look forward to doing. Thanks, uh, Scott Weiss from uh, Nemours DuPont. Um, and this is going to be a bit of a leading question, in, in part, full disclosure, I was part of the panel. And, um, so um, but I think it's important that we discuss this point, right? So the data that were available, right, came from hospital-based EHR systems. So these patients all received some level of treatment. I'm sure it was highly variable, but I think we can make that assumption, right? So this is really identifying patients with suspected or proven infection who had a high risk of mortality despite treatment of some sort, right? Um, so, but from a practical standpoint as a clinician, we're gonna have to make choices about starting patients um, on treatment before they get treatment, right? And so the, uh, when I'm faced with a patient um, who just presents or gets sicker in the, in the hospital, um, and I need to make a decision about whether to treat them for sepsis or not, um, the risk factors that may put them at risk for higher mortality might be different before they get treatment than if I already started treatment, right? Such that if I withhold treatment because I say they haven't met Phoenix sepsis criteria, um, they may um, uh, deteriorate to the point where they eventually do, right? But we wouldn't want that to happen, right? We'd want to intervene beforehand, right? So I don't think we want people to go back and sort of change the criteria to get into their clinical pathway for sepsis that they have to wait to start treatment until they meet Phoenix um, criteria. So um, some of this will, I think, will be resolved when further work is done to try to predict the clinical factors that um, put you at high risk of developing Phoenix um, sepsis, right? So that, that work is ongoing, and I look forward to that. But in the meantime, what do we, how do we label those patients who come in and we start treatment um, and we prevent them from meeting Phoenix um, sepsis criteria uh, because our treatment was so good? Or because we're treating them um, with a single vasoactive agent uh, for a slightly elevated lactate, but it doesn't, we, we haven't quite meet those thresholds. Um, how do we label that? And maybe that goes to some of the documentation piece about billing and so on, but, but what, in the, in the interim, till we have more, this work progresses further, what do we call that? How do we label, how do we talk about that at the bedside? How do we teach our residents, our fellows, our nurses, um, to label that condition. So maybe just before we go to the panelists' answers, one point to just highlight in that context. When you look at the sepsis three manuscript from 2016, QSOFA was developed and tested with the same outcome as sepsis criteria. So it was benchmarked the mortality as an outcome. And the area under the curve, you know, was probably less than what you would want from many sepsis screening tools. And so one of the points you highlight too is that actually diagnosing disease needs a different approach as well in terms of the outcomes you want to test and actually early recognition before actually some interventions already happen. Um, and so very keen to hear you know, the thoughts of the task force here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, Scott, thanks for highlighting that point that I'm not sure we said with enough um, clarity. These, Criteria are sufficient but not necessary to require and benefit from sepsis treatment. Um, there are many children outside of these criteria who should be treated for suspicion for early sepsis. We've never had a good name for that. Suspected sepsis, early sepsis, many hospitals have developed kind of two-tiered um, sepsis treatment pathways where there's a way to expedite care for possible early sepsis. Um, maybe we do need to name this better, um, but it's, it's, it exists. We don't know what to call it, and we don't know exactly how to find those kids yet. So I would, I would vote for at risk of sepsis, and I think we've improved the situation because before having sepsis was so um, insensitive Oh, sorry, it's overly sensitive and, and so poorly specific that it didn't carry the clinical weight, the definition, you know, our impression of the, the word didn't um, match 
the inclusiveness of the definition. And I think we're, we're close to that. If we discussed it at risk of sepsis, at, and if we see sepsis now, we're genuinely worried about it, and we know how worried from these data, that, that perhaps is the terminology. And all of these patients, and you guys can jump in, they, they had some evidence for infection, which since this was EHR data, was they had already undergone antimicrobial um, treatment or infectious testing. And that's half the battle in deciding who's at risk for sepsis. So some of that mental clinical work had already been done to get into this data set. That in that context, anything from an ID perspective, how would you, you know, put these criteria into context as well of, of the need for antimicrobial stewardship, for example? So I agree with the comments that have been made. I think the at risk of sepsis um, is, a, is a good way of describing them. But as Halden says, this is not a score that determines who gets treatment. Uh, that's a clinical decision based on the child in front of you. And this is just about identifying accurately what we mean when we say a child has got sepsis. Good morning, or I guess afternoon now. Um, Ron Bode, I'm interviewing from San Diego. First of all, amazing. I, I mean, applause to the entire panel and everyone who worked on this. Uh, not just for the numbers, but I think for clarity on what sepsis is. Uh, I agree with one of the panels who said that Sears really didn't do pedi pediatric care any any sort of benefit. You know, Sears was such a broad definition that really every single patient in pediatrics has a fever and tachycardia uh, when they have any infection, and many of them are at home. So I think this was a really great thought process, the way the team came to the conclusion that it's going to help us as a field. Um, my question was in terms of clinical decision support uh, tools in the future, um, is there a thought about reanalyzing this huge data set for different outcomes uh, so that later clinical decision support can actually give you not just this patient is a high risk for death, but this particular one maybe is not as high risk for death, but is at risk for multi-organ dysfunction, at risk for long length of stay, at risk for mechanical ventilation, these kinds of things uh, in a computer model. Yeah, I mean, as you might imagine, we could probably analyze this data set for the rest of our careers. Um, and we certainly welcome you know, that type of input um, as to the questions that the community thinks are most important and the elements of the CDS tools that they most uh, want to see um, you know, I do want to highlight the question of MODS um, because of the potential for some circularity now that organ dysfunction is a key piece of the sepsis diagnosis, that that might not be a thing we can build and be confident in. Um, but we're really looking forward to, you know, lo looking at all these sub-analyses. Another question, might, um, might the fact that renal dysfunction was not associated with death be related to the fact that we can provide renal replacement therapy and so we children don't usually die from renal dysfunction? I think I think the 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 reason why we were we didn't need the renal dysfunction is because many of the kids who develop renal dysfunction um, are kids with septic shock. In fact, the, most of the as you know the sepsis associated AKI uh, literature oftentimes is actually septic shock associated AKI uh, because of the strong association with hemodynamics. So I think we were capturing those kids who went on to develop um, renal dysfunction and require um, renal replacement therapy. Um, by just capturing those who had sepsis and shock. So uh, it was sort of like not necessary to capture the diagnosis of sepsis. Now, a kid who has shock who never develops renal dysfunction is a very different kid than the kid who has shock and develops renal dysfunction. Hence, for the stratification of those kids and the management of those patients, it's absolutely critical that we take into account uh, the, the presence of uh, uh, sub, uh, septic shock associated AKI or sepsis associated AKI, and we managed in the, in, in the appropriate way. So I don't think it was uh, uh, related to, to renal replacement therapy, but, but more to the fact that, that we were already capturing those patients at risk uh, with, the, with this more, um, I guess, higher level uh, criteria of, of just the hemodynamic component of, of sepsis, uh, if that makes sense. And, and I'll just highlight that the we only needed four organ systems in lower resource environments as well, where CRRT isn't necessarily available to those patients. So um, I think that emphasizes uh, what, what Nelson was saying. Hi, Asia Goldnick from St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Um, echoing everyone's thanks for both the amazing amount of work to do this, but also presenting it so succinctly at this meeting. 
I wanted to go back to the performance of this definition across different patient populations. You talked about age and different resource settings. How about different patient populations with comorbidities, like children with cancer? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really important um, uh, piece of, of the comorbidity. So we, we looked up, at, at it in both ways. So we looked at kids with malignancy. We also looked at kids who did not have any, any other, um, uh, who are previously healthy. And, and the issue here goes back a little bit to what Mark presented in terms of, it, um, you know, the, how difficult it, it gets to, uh, when you try to adjudicate mortality in a patient with a comorbidity. Um, uh, to sepsis when they may be dying from their AML or you know or, or whatever whatever other complications you may have in the setting, particularly uh, uh, you know uh, with, with the malignancy as a comorbidity. Um, so we uh, we looked at the data. Obviously, the performance uh, you know in terms of, of specificity suffers a little bit when you get into that comorbid uh, population, particularly for the outcome of in hospital mortality. It's a little bit cleaner when you look at the er, uh, the other outcome, which is early death or uh, ECMO, which we which even though it was a secondary outcome, and honestly feels more real uh, for for the outcome of of uh, uh, sepsis in the first 24 hours, something that is dying really early on or, or requiring extracorporeal um, support. Um, and that's in that subset, it was a little bit cleaner. Um, but I think it's, you know, it still performs well. It still performed better, mightily better than the IPSCC criteria. So we got that. It's better than what, what it was existing. But I think it's still a challenging uh, population to, to, uh, to capture. Um, yeah, I will leave it at that. Other questions? Yes, please. One last question. Thank you. Uh, Grace Artega, Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Pediatric Critical Care. Um, I want to uh, uh, basically uh, state how grateful we are for all the work you guys have done. For years, we have struggled trying to figure out which patients needed what kind of treatment based on the classification that we had at that time. So thank you. On the other hand, uh, twice I have heard that the secondary outcome was ECMO. So I wonder in this subset population, can you elaborate a little bit more how are we gonna be treating those ECMO patients? Because based on the, this criteria, all those patients have the highest numbers and they're at high risk of infection. So should we consider them septic or with septic shock or do we need to classify them differently? Thank you. Right. Apparently, I get to jump on that grenade. Um, so, um, for clarity, uh, the secondary outcome that, and, and we agreed that the task force requested that we look at in addition to mortality was the composite of early death or ECMO. And the goal there was to capture uh, the heterogeneity in different sites that may or may not have different types of organ system support. Um, but to get to that patient who really firstly presented with an infection that was causing their life-threatening organ dysfunction and then ultimately succumbed to it early or was placed on a very invasive um, uh, type of organ system support that is not uh, universally available. So the goal was not at all to make recommendations about ECMO support, but rather to have a sensitivity analysis of the primary outcome of in-hospital mortality that was focused in on those patients that we uh, felt like were really coming in very, very sick, if, does, if that makes sense. Martha uh, Curley, uh, University of Pennsylvania and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, wonderful work, you know, simply stellar in your um, steadfast uh, commitment to this project over five years uh, should be applauded. Um, I do uh, agree with Scott Weiss. Uh, trajectory over time and the patient's responsiveness is a huge question. Now that you have this, you need to hopefully move into that direction because as a clinical trial, is, you know, patients meet criteria and they move quickly. They don't like sit there. And where they hit it and how they respond to treatment um, is a huge factor that should be considered. Uh, but my question is more philosophical. So this is 2024, I think. Um, what happens in 20, you know, 34, if you were to rebuild a model 
you know, to give us more information, what didn't you have in the current model that you wished you have going forward for a future model, number one, and that what kind of untrained machine learning techniques uh, can be used on these data to give us some sense of things that are salient that haven't been operationally defined, you know, in previous MOD scores. I suspect multiple people are going to have thoughts on this because it's a fun one. Um, but you alluded to, and, and I also uh, referenced in, in our presentation, that I do think that trajectories, the, the way that these scores and criteria move um, with time um, in a patient with and without different types of intervention, um, as those signals in some sense represent phenotypes will be how we're thinking about them, or I hope is how we're thinking about them in the next version of this. Um, and then I think, and I'll, I'll toss it to the others, I do think that we're gonna have to maintain that tension between pragmatism and enthusiasm about novel data types that might be added in and carefully consider the relative value in increased performance if we say considered measured laboratory biomarkers that are not currently clinically available or images or physiological signals, just how much benefit is there compared to what we would lose in generalizability to the whole world? I, I think, I love that question, Martha, because I think the, the what I would look forward for the next definitions, not only of sepsis, but many of the other conditions that we treat in the ICU, is that we start moving away from the binary approach, because we we really li like to have a line in the sand, you have ARDS, you do not have ARDS, you have sepsis, you don't have sepsis. When we really, many of these kids live in a spectrum that, that, that evolves over time. So I think embracing more of the trajectory and the probability of trajectories uh, as we make decisions in these kids would be, would be great. And for these definitions in the future, or criteria in the future to match what, how we think about these patients at the bedside, we don't look at things you know, in a snapshot. We look at how were things 12 hours ago, how are they evolving now, how, and, and try to make a prediction of what's gonna happen in the future. That's how we think at the bedside. So hopefully this uh, criteria in the, in the future embrace that, that uh, dynamic, dynamic component um, uh, of, of how we think clinically. Uh, I don't think we have the tools. I don't think we have the, um, you know, the, uh, the current uh, ability to uh, you know, change the paradigm to that extent yet. However, we did a little bit of a tricky thing here where we are putting forth a score for sepsis we have a binary you know, threshold at two points, but the score goes all the way to 13 points. And if you look at that over time as a trajectory, uh, hopefully that, that you, that you'll, the, some, some um, differences will start emerging in terms of what organ functions are affected, how they are affected, and a kid with a sepsis score of two um, is gonna be very different than one who has a sepsis score of six, and how those are maybe managed may also, the, 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 you know, how aggressive you may be or whatnot, or, or whether you enroll in a trial or not. Uh, may, may change a little bit. So um, hopefully we're starting to embrace more of that spectrum uh, and more of that trajectory as opposed to sort of the old school, you know, binary classification of things that we, we'd love to, um, to do. Maybe so, you know, one aspect that we actually have not spoken much about here is that we deliberately have not spoken much about this regulated host response. Um, because although it's part of the sepsi 3 definition, actually we still don't really know what it what it means, and it's even you know sophisticated measures are not available in most settings, and we don't really know what the best sophisticated measures would be. And but but one important aspect is, is pathogen dependence, and so what we've seen in the data set, and you've briefly alluded to this, there um, it's very different if you have a child with RSV to a child with, you know, staphylococcal septic shock, or, um, for example, children with dengue septic shock in some of the lower income settings. And I'd be keen to hear maybe as well from, from some of the other panelists, what are your thoughts on you know, getting, getting more focus on the pathogens as well in, in this context? Yeah, that's great, but that's more than another five years work. I mean, I can't see, and it changes so quickly. I mean, the, those, those survival curves were all informed by UK meningococcal disease 10 years ago. So that profile has changed completely with immunization. Um, so it's a moving target that will take a long time to catch up with, but of course we should. Um, in thinking back to some of the maybe controversy about having some of our treatments be forming part of this score, 
in terms of neurologic GCS and respiratory support. Was there any thought, or I guess what's the reasoning for using P to F or S to F ratio instead of OI or OSI? Again, maybe to reduce a little bit of that variability in what might I do with a patient for respiratory support versus what my, one of my colleagues do. Yeah, sure. Um, so actually, uh, uh, thankfully, we're, we're uh, much better at using uh, a good amount of pressure on uh, ventilated kids. So hopefully, we don't have as many issues with PF and SF ratio. When we've looked at the comparison of who is captured with PF, SF versus OI, OSI, it's actually very similar. We had OSI and OI as part of the podium criteria, and they were evaluated against the PF and SF ratio, and those came up on top. Um, so I think from a data-driven standpoint, I think there, there was no reason to have a more complex uh, um, definition that included mean, or, uh, mean airway pressure. Um, uh, but um, again, going with the theme of simplicity, uh, how can we do, you know, get to the same sort of uh, level of, of discrimination of those who have life-threatening organ dysfunction without making it extremely complex? Um, and one thing about the, the intervention that I want to mention is if you don't have vasoactives and you continue to deteriorate, you're probably going to end up with a very low blood pressure, and that will make you meet the criteria for cardiovascular dysfunction. And even if you're not in mechanical ventilation, you can you can achieve uh, you know points um, uh, in the respiratory dysfunction if you're if you're really hypoxemic, uh, even a non-invasive. Uh, so I think there there's uh, some some um, uh, you know so built-in uh, redundancy that allows to capture those patients even if you're not using interventions. And then the GCS issue, I think it's, you know, we're, we're throwing a lot of, you know, uh, uh, comments about, you know, the GCS not, maybe not being as valuable in terms of because it can be obscured by sedation and things like that. And I agree, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a great clean measure, but it's pretty much the best we have so far for, you know, diagnosing, you know, acute brain dysfunction, I guess, um, and encephalopathy in the, in the setting of sepsis. And as we saw in the systematic review, it's one of the highest risk factors for mortality in those kids is having a, 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 an altered level of consciousness. So I think we cannot uh, allow ourselves to not have uh, some measure of encephalopathy uh, uh, in general, and the data bore that out in, in the sense that it, that that was a you know highly predictive piece of of, of the of the of the score. So um, you know GCS gets gets a bad rep, but it's what we have right now. Until we have something better, um, have, we should keep using it. I think. I just have a question um, for Tell and Nelson about. The people have brought up about pathogen specificity. Um, I'm Adrian Randolph from um, Boston Children's, and I also was part of this uh, process. But the um, be, your data sets are pre-COVID, and I was wondering if you have a plan to refresh the data or maybe get another grant and, and like add in more data that includes COVID because the coagulopathy variables are often elevated, even though the kid's not that sick. And so some, you know, anyways, I think it is something that would be helpful. Adrian, 100% agree, and I'm delighted to hear of your commitment of submitting Boston Children's Hospital data to that work. So <laughs> we look forward to collaborating with you. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I'm, no, we're definitely uh, happy to participate. and. I think it would be great to refresh the database for, just because it may have really changed things and the coagulopathy things may not be as sensitive, you know, I mean, or as specific if, as to what we really think is, is sepsis because the mortality, even in the ICU in our big data sets were very, very low, like 1.4% in kids who were all in the ICU. So, I mean, they're, all of a lot of them would be labeled sepsis. I'm just not sure is that what we want to label them all sepsis. Yep, great question. Definitely on our list. Thank you. That was terrific, Aruna Natarajan, NIH. Um, I, I think this is amazing because it opens a gateway to multiple areas of inquiry. But uh, to to feed off Martha's point on what would you think you'd want to have done? 10 years ago, 10 years later, um, a couple of things came to mind. Pathogen change with climate change, post-RSV vaccination differences that you might want to wonder, I mean, that actually builds on what Adrian mentioned on COVID. And 
One of the things um, I think to think about would be stem cell transplant populations because the, there's an expansion of scope. And their trajectories are likely to be more nose dives as also gene editing. So these were some 10 years into the future things that struck me. Thank you very much, wonderful. Thank you, Aruna, great ideas. Do you want to answer to that, or? I, I couldn't hear. Was there a question? I thought it was, no, no, a, statement. No. I thought it was a statement. Yeah. 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 Um, now, as we move towards the conclusion, so the, you know, this was massive work, and again, you know, we cannot enough thank and acknowledge the work by, by the data team led by Talon Nelson to get that far. Um, you know, we've had what I think for most of us was the most intensive Delphi voting ever seen. So we've, we, you know, we've, we've had hourly sessions every week where the data team presented the analysis that sometimes I think had been generated just hours before. And we saw straight away, you know, epidemiology, performance, mortality outcomes, you know, which then would straight inform the voting. And we did this for about three months during the summer holiday period, right? So um, just again, you know, playing, saying credit to the huge work done by the data team. But despite this achievement, I think this, this is not perfect and this leaves many gaps and many things, you know, to be addressed. And in addition to the dissemination which has started today, there's aspects of implementation. And so one aspect is actually how can this be used to measure disease burden, for example. We've already discussed quite a lot actually how this can now be the context to develop better tools that allow us to recognize sepsis earlier, because this is not what we have now put forward yet. And of course, we, we really look forward to independent validation and controversy, but we're wondering if, Scott, if you want to comment on the aspect actually of, of measuring burn of disease and CDC type surveillance criteria. Um, yeah, thank you. So, um, you know, after Sepsis 3 was, uh, was published, a group out of Harvard uh, partnered with the CDC to develop a surveillance definition, which is basically a simplified uh, version of uh, Sepsis 3 that uh, could easily be um, uh, um, applied to various different EHRs in order to identify epidemiological cases of adult sepsis. And so the SECM task force has partnered with a group uh, that includes that Harvard group as well as um, a group um, at, at Nemours and, and CHOP where we're going to be um, uh, developing a, a parallel surveillance definition for pediatric sepsis uh, with a toolkit that will allow hospitals, whether they're academic centers or community hospitals, to basically apply that to their electronic health record. And so um, the CDC will be able to use this to track uh, epidemiological cases of pediatric sepsis and septic shock uh, over time and allow for benchmarking and so on. So. I think it's a nice uh, way that we could um, start to implement uh, these criteria in a way that could pr inform public health and, and various aspects related to that. Thanks, Scott. So we just wanted to <clears throat> thank, Lauren and I wanted to thank, and, and on behalf of the task force, the Society of Critical Care Medicine for uh, sponsoring this effort, uh, the SCCM Executive Director Lynn Redford uh, worked with us for the past year and a half and was just absolutely extraordinary, uh, answering emails at two in the morning, working on weekends and holidays, uh, and was instrumental in this uh, being done. We learned a lot from uh, some of the leaders of the Sepsis 3 uh, effort, Derek Angus, Cliff Deutschman, and Chris Seymour. They helped us from the very beginning and all along the way as we hit various stumbling blocks. Uh, again, uh, Talon Nelson uh, leading the amazing uh, analysis team. Andrew Argent and Lauren Source, our new SCCM president, were co-chairs and instrumental. Andrew wasn't able to make it today because he's uh, in South Africa and it was a bit of a long journey for him at this time of year. Uh, and then, of course, Lauren is uh, 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 taking the throne today, so she's quite tied up. Uh, Kusum Menem was our uh, methodologist. Uh, she's in. Ottawa and was phenomenal, instrumental, uh, both for the systematic review and for the consensus process. Uh, and then uh, we couldn't have done this without Jerry and Tex, who uh, from the very beginning uh, provided senior mentorship for, for the whole group, really. Uh, and then, of course, the data wouldn't have happened without the NIH collaborators and then the, uh, the incredible work of the task force. And I also wanted to thank everyone here today for really great questions, great discussion. I uh, really appreciate uh, your sticking around also to the very end of this.
So thank you very much. Thanks to the task force, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing more from this. Bye-bye.